formally welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us for today's event um, which is titled open science and the dissemination of scholarly knowledge with a particular focus on the normalization of preprints within the MENA region um, first of all, I really want to say thank you so much to the International Science Council for agreeing to collaborate with us on this event. Uh, this is the first of the Forum for Open Research's community development activities, as I mentioned earlier, and we're absolutely thrilled to have had this opportunity to work uh, with such a prestigious institution and really bring more awareness of preprints to the region. Slide, please. So just before we start, and I hand over to uh, Jeffrey for the International Science Council, just a little bit about who we are, the Forum for Open Research in MENA. Now, some of you might know us already, but for those of you who don't, we are a newly launched nonprofit membership organization supporting the advancement of open science policies and practices um, in research communities and institutions across the Arab region. Now, we really believe that the Arab states have the resources and capability to play a pivotal role in the global transition towards a more accessible, sustainable and inclusive research and education model. And we want to support all of our research communities and stakeholder groups in their journey towards a more open world by facilitating the exchange of actionable insights and the development of practical policies. And just a brief note, um, any research institution or research community is welcome to join us if you're based within this region, or if you believe you have something to contribute to the discussion um, and supporting our mission and membership is free. So what do we do? Uh, Victoria, if you could skip to the next slide quickly. We're effectively a catalyst for positive action, and we work with key stakeholders to develop and implement a pr pragmatic program to facilitate that transition towards uh, a more open education system um, and more open science practices in this region. And our driving focus is very much on building the resources, building the membership, and building the organizational structures and developing the broader community to support the advancement of open science um, with all our stakeholder groups across this region. And within that, we have three key pillars. There's resources. Um, specifically, we're trying to develop localized resources in Arabic. I know there's a lot of stuff around for English speakers, but we're trying to, to make everything more accessible for the region. There's the annual forum, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the very end of the event. And then there's our community development activities, which is effectively uh, events like today's. Um, and on that note, I'm just so excited to bring us over to the agenda for today. Victoria, if you could skip to the next slide. As you'll see, it's a really rich, um, really, really rich and hopefully meaty and thought provoking uh, program for today. And I really hope we'll get some some really strong outcomes at the end of it. Um, so first of all, I will now hand over to Jeffrey Bolton. Professor Jeffrey Bolton, even, who <laughs> will give the welcome. He is Regius Professor of Geo Geology Emeritus at the University of Edinburgh and a board member of the International Science Council. Um, he's also past president of the Commission on Data for Science and Technology and chairs the Academic Advisory Council of the University of Heidelberg. And he's cre helped create a new university in Dubai and also reviewed several uh, Saudi universities. And um, I will hand over to him now. Thank you, Emily. So welcome everyone to this seminar and workshop organized by the International Science Council in collaboration with the Forum for Open Research in the Middle East and North Africa. It's concerned with open science and the dissemination of scholarly knowledge, focusing in particular on the role that preprints could play in reforming scientific publishing. The scientific enterprise may even now be transforming itself in the direction of greater openness. Uh, scientific publishing is a vital part of that enterprise, but there are grave doubts that the currently dominant systems of publishing are well adapted to the needs of science, and particularly to the needs of a new era of open science. Although reform may be called for, and how it might be achieved, and what modes of publication could be promoted as means of achieving necessary reform is open to question which is one of the principal purposes of this meeting. It's with that background that we ask whether the rapidly evolving preprint movement could make a significant contribution to reform and what would be the issues that would need to be tackled for this to become a reality. It's important to recognize that any changes need to satisfy the priorities of researchers, those who fund them 
and the university that are the dominant employers. It's also important to note that the size, that one size does not fit all. Different disciplines in different regions have different needs. The starting address, keynote address, is by Ismail Sarageldin, who will place these issues in a larger tapestry of the development of science and scientific thought, a historical context that is vital if we're to understand the large issues that need to be addressed. We could find no better person to do this than Ismail Sarageldin. He is one of the Arab world's foremost intellects, the Emeritus Librarian of Alexandria, and was founding director of the Bibliotheca Alexandrina. He's made significant contributions to many important international causes and has been a strong advocate for science. And he was an important and an early inaugural patron of the International Science Council, and his lectures have frankly become legendary. Ismail, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, I am very committed to uh, the, uh, the idea of open science. And as you know, you and I have also worked on the African Open Science Platform with many hot floor and many other colleagues. But let me just go through what I want to cover today in my address to you. I'll start with a prologue, which is really a bit of history and then come to our changing world, why I do believe indeed that the time for open science is here and how uh, preprints will play a big role and then end with eight fundamental principles that the uh, uh, International Science Council has articulated. So if we start with the seven pillars, how science is practiced and how it advances, well, uh, we start with the empiric method, the validation of ideas, cumulative advances, access to the world, work of others, and recognizing priority of discovery. And then interaction with the new technologies has become fundamental, but we're still back in, in the issue of publishing. But then we need to maintain the scientific record and ensure that truth triumphs. Let me start with that. Uh, uh, authority in science rests in the rational empirical method, not an individual or a theory or belief. Now, actually, uh, since we are in the Middle East, I should pay tribute to Ibn al-Haytham, who already in the 10th century, 11th century, relied on experiment rather than past authority. He was the first to promote this about several centuries ahead of uh, Newton, Descartes, and Galileo, and others. Uh, he designed the experimental method and did other work on optics. Uh, later on, it would be picked up by Bacon, Descartes, Galileo, and others. And in modern parlance, uh, Karl Popper has as the very important point that scientific knowledge has to be falsifiable. In other words, we have to be able to prove or disprove what is being asserted by the basis of experiment. So therefore, all knowledge is partially approximative. It's based on empirical and it has to be replicable so that other people um, will do the same. Professor Ismail, if I could just yeah. one second, um, you have not yet started sharing your slides. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm not sure when that was starting, but just, I've been sharing them with, I'm sorry. Is it, do you, what do you see now? Um, what, what you, uh, just the, uh, the holding slide. The photo of you, that's all. No, no, I mean, the, the, the sharing screen isn't working or what? Um, Victoria, if, can I hand over to you for this? You see the, if you see the slide, therefore it must be, the sharing screen must be working, right? Uh, we're yeah. not seeing your slides. Yeah, we don't see your slides, uh, Ismail. Um... Okay, let me try this again now, like that. Yes, is I that think now I'm... visible? Is that my slide visible? I it's, think it's coming. Um, yes, there it's we go. There. Yes. yes. Now, now no, it's your first slide, slide, your introduction. Okay, that's just the the opening, the title slide. So this is my outline and prologue, which I mentioned with a bit of history. And uh, I said that these are the seven of how science is practiced and advanced. And I started with the empiric method. And can you see this is now changing? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. That's fine. Because I'm going to go very fast. So that's fundamentally modern science 
rests authority rests on the rational empirical method, not on the authority of any person. And since we are in the Middle East, we should also pay tribute to Ibn al-Haytham, who was the first to do this back in the 10th, 11th century, about several centuries ahead of Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, and uh, Bacon. And in the modern sense, we say uh, from Karl Popper and others that scientific knowledge has to be falsifiable. So somebody has to be able to test whether what the assertion is correct or it's wrong. And therefore, assertions are approximative until through empirical knowledge, replicably empirical knowledge, we have uh, satisfaction on it. The experiment you all know, we normally say that even if results of experiment support the hypothesis, it is supported. It doesn't mean that it has become absolute truth. Uh, we know this even if it lasts for a long time. And after all, Newtonian physics lasted for several centuries until Einstein came and changed everything uh, of our understanding of time and space and matter and energy and gravity. So what we have therefore is the promotion of ideas and validation. And it advances by this replication and evidence of correctness, not the high authority of any individual. Even the great Einstein, who is arguably the greatest scientist of the 20th century and one of the three or four greatest scientists in history, his radical theories on relativity had to be proven correct before it was accepted. But his assertions about quantum uh, uh, entanglement, which he didn't accept, were proven wrong. So Einstein can be proven right or wrong, as a young man of 26 years old, he published five papers in 1905. He didn't even have a PhD at the time, but it was published by, by uh, uh, the Annalen de Physique at the time. And his radical ideas later on, 10 years later, about how gravity is really warps in space time uh, seemed impossible to, to accept until Arthur in uh, uh, May 29, 1919, actually measured the position of a star near an eclipse. And that showed, in fact, that uh, the distortion that Einstein predicted was correct. And that was the acceptance of that theory. But then Einstein, when, uh, with uh, the, the, the einstein Podolsky rosen paper in 1935, had tremendous difficulty accepting quantum entanglement. And he called it spooky action at a distance. And yet today, we have, of course, quantum physics has been accepted everywhere and proven. More recently, eminent professors like uh, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann in 1989 claimed that they had achieved cold fusion in the laboratory, and there they are, and it received enormous uh, publicity. This time cover you can see here, but their experiments could not be replicated, and as a result, it fell by the wayside. On the other hand, claims that were considered very difficult sometimes, like uh, Barry Marshall's and Robin Warren's claim that ulcers were caused by bacterium, uh, Helicobacter pylori, and not by excessive acidity and tension and all of these things, uh, uh, proved correct. In fact, Dr. Marshall ingested the bacteria to prove it, and they won the Nobel Prize for recognition that this uh, claim, which seems so difficult compared to the accepted view in medicine was true. Another one, James Ellison, who published his vision that the immune system could fight cancer in 95, 96, and he fought for almost 30 years, I was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2018 because it proved correct. And uh, so whether it was Ellison or Marshall and Robin and so on, you get proof in the end is validate somebody, not the authority of the person who speaks, not even Einstein. Then there is the fact that it's cumulative and that's why people have to access the work of other people. And the greatest and best statement on that comes from uh, Isaac Newton, who in 1675 said in a letter, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. That is about giving others whose work is being accessed, giving them their due. So access to the work of others becomes essential. And today, thanks to the digital revolution and the internet, everything is easily accessible anytime. We have indeed created global knowledge in the sense 
What is being done in Brazil is known in the UK, is known in Dubai, is known in China within a day or so. And for me as a librarian, this is a librarian's dream because at the fingertips of everybody, you can put the entire global knowledge of the world. But at the same time, we also have social media and a lot of mischief and disinformation and fake news. But recognizing the priority of others is extremely important. And I'll give you one of the best examples of that. We all know, of course, about Mendel and Mendelian uh, laws of heredity. Well, Mendel was a monk who was working in his garden with peas and he published a paper in 1865. But due to the relative obscurity of the journal, the work remained unnoticed for three decades. These three most eminent botanists at the turn of the century independently arrived at the same conclusions that Mendel had reached three decades before. And uh, then they were preparing the list of uh, the literature, the prior literature on the topic. They ran across his paper and they said, no, I mean, he deserves to be given pride of place. And so Mendel is rightly honored today. And we talk about the Mendelian's law of hereditary. We don't talk about the Corrin's law or the, or, or the others. And I think he is rightly honored, but we should also honor the three eminent botanists for their exemplary ethical behavior. There was no stealing of the credit from him at all, even though he was dead and he didn't have a family to defend him. Then there is, of course, the interaction with new technologies. By that, I mean that science advances with new technology in new domains. Just imagine the invention of the telescope, of course, and the stories of Galileo. Newton invented the, the mirror telescope, and then all the way to the Hubble and the Webb telescope. So they, they have revolutionized a lot of the work we did in astronomy. The microscope changed, of course, a lot of science. And today's multiple revolutions, the internet, ICT, biology, artificial intelligence, and so much more are opening up new avenues that didn't exist and that are resulting as an important point for where we get, we're going in a very fast pace for the development of science. Now look at artificial intelligence of alpha fold did for protein folding. Now this is the way protein molecule looks like. It's incredibly complicated and uh, misfolds can uh, have major impacts as we learned at the time of the medical mm -hmm. disease issue. But fundamentally, it takes, used to take years of graduate student time to develop the 3D perspective on a single molecule. And uh, today, the alpha fold was able to do this incredibly complicated stuff very, very quickly. In fact, so quickly that we did 200 million protein molecules, all those known to science in one year. So if you can imagine all of these, if if, if one would have taken, say, a few years from a graduate student, let's say five years, that would mean that the artificial intelligence uh, did this task in, in one year for one billion years of graduate student research, 200 million molecules. And that, that shows you what's happening and the pace of change in all domains of science today and why we must need to be accessing this as it happens in more or less real time. And then we have to ensure that scientific record is there for who did this first priority, who did, builds on whom, and the ability to retest everything that everybody does. In the past, it used to be that scientists were subject to authority. In 1963, Galileo had to stand and recant, and otherwise he would have probably been burnt alive. But, uh, but as he said, it still moves. But then over the long haul, and certainly in the last few centuries, over the long haul, science prevails. Charles Darwin and, uh, and the battles that occurred in the, from the 19th to the 20th century in that is real. And so today we say, well, the internet and social media have created misinformation and disinformation and fake news. But guess what? This also existed before. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But so today people are attacking science and important public information and the scientists have to respond to that. And therefore they have to have access to the latest and most important information. Now, what's that? Not, that's not new because the public press, which grew along with literacy throughout the 18th century, played a role in science. Before we got distinguished newspapers like that, we had a lot of crappy newspapers who <laughs> saying anything and everything. So think of Edward Jenner, who, as you know, took cowpox uh, to make vaccines against smallpox. And uh, he was successful, of course, in that. And uh, look at this cartoon from uh, Punch 
in 1802, uh, attacking this, this general doing a vaccine, attacking him, and look what is showing. People are growing cows out of their bodies, coming out, uh, uh, telling people that if you take the vaccine, this is what will happen to you. Not very different from the current anti-vaxxer that you hear. But that is why science tried to create true resources, the, the, the credible resources. We had the learned societies and the learned societies created scientific journals, which along with books became the fundamental means of communicating science and maintaining the scientific record. But in fact, what happened is that uh, uh, this uh, peer review process was there to protect the quality of the work, but it gradually created different problems. The, we have institutional barriers to access. We have incomplete backing for scientific claims. Just the conclusion is published, but you, if you want to recheck the data that's behind it, you can't do it. And now we know that the data is extremely important. So the data and analysis, and we need to have access to them. But then above all, there's also been a very slow transmission from author to public. And we felt this very clearly at the time of the pandemic. So we need to deal with all of this and recognize that in our changing world, we are no longer bound by the boundaries of any uh, nation, that we have communications among scientists across the whole world due to the internet. Global knowledge is there, as I mentioned before. And we have also converging new sciences emerging that therefore require a different perspective on the disciplinarity of the publications themselves and the ability to do that. Now, all of that is really wonderful because it's expanding our brain's reach beyond anything our parents could imagine. And we can see digital technology solutions which are way beyond anything that anybody had before. Uh, now, science public still has major problems, including four major problems I'll highlight here. The reviewers see the published conclusions and underlying data and many cannot be invalidated by attempted replication. The data sets are very important conclusions themselves, very valuable resources, but they're not available. And much of the material is inaccessible to many due to paywalls and other obstacles, which should not exist. And the process of publication has become way too slow given the past phase, the past phase of modern times. And so the science community responded to that by launching the open science movement. What is the open science movement? Well, it's been around for a while and uh, Jeff, he, uh, Jeffrey Bolton is one of the, the great gurus of that. It's a movement to make scientific research data dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society, whether they're amateurs or professionals. And this is made possible because of the uh, uh, ICT revolution. So you have uh, open science is all about open data, open source, open methodology, open peer review, open access, et cetera, et cetera. And what is an open science framework? It requires free software for scientists, free and open resource, public private workflows, seamless integration, promotes collaboration, and it allows you to manage your project, archive your data, quickly share files, control access and collaboration, supercharge your workflow when you work with others because change is happening with such incredible speed that you really need to do this. Sometimes through AI, handling uh, ever more complex reality and the enormous tsunami of big data we are seeing. So open science is a vital enabler for countries to minimize risks and maximize seizing opportunities. It helps in maintaining the rigor and the reliability of science. It allows creativity and in, in integrating diverse data resources, promotes open innovation, and facilitates engaging with other societal actors. It will be fundamental to the realization, I think, of the uh, SDGs towards sustainable development, because we do not want to see increasing inequalities, more and more people poor, people being left behind as others advance through science and applications. So the important obstacles are that we need to make good use of data resources and disciplinarity and across different countries cannot easily be achieved because of varying and incompatible standards, but that is something the scientific community can handle. And even where the data is easily available, integration can only be achieved usually within and between closely allied fields. And therefore, we have defined uh, ways of thinking about the data. We say fair, which means it has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and stream, sovereignty, trusted reusability, exchangeability, actionable, and measurability. All very nice. And we're saying, you know, we need to turn it into a, a public goods commodity. 
and that requires exchanges, connectors, catalogs, brokers, and having a market infrastructure for the handling of such data. But here we must deal with a new reality, which is the large tech companies. Look at the top companies, top tech companies in the world, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, etc. They are almost all American actually, but the fundamental huge uh, control that they have in terms of the access to the global market of information. But the scientific community is well on its way and the modern technologies help us deal with the scale of information and its accessibility. The, the National Academies of Science have uh, produced this consensus report already about open by design, open science by design. UNESCO is claiming that. And of course, well, what about the ISC? Well, the ISC has done a lot of things. A lot is this very inclusive, excellent definition that science that is open, what is open science? Science that is open to scrutiny and challenge and to the knowledge needs of, and interests of wider publics. And one of the key tools that will help us in this is the preprints. So what are preprints? Well, a preprint is usually a work in progress that an author is about ready to send for publication. Then usually you go through a, a, a review process and then it goes to a post print, which the author gives to the manuscript uh, to the publisher and then the publisher publishes it. So we are saying, can we not see what is happening here in open science, we should because the, the review peer process should be part of the open process before it gets published. So preprints have always existed, but they've been buried in the publication process. They've been hidden from the public in this cycle between the author, the peer reviewers, and the editor. And that needs to be changed. And I think that's part of what we do. Uh, let me see here. This is the current situation right now. You have a scientist who produces a manuscript who sends it to a journal and then the editor uh, can reject it in which case the scientists have to start all over again or he sends it to peer review and the peer reviewers then comment to the scientist who then submits it again until it comes out in publication. Well, the preprint would say that the scientist, the manuscript, then it goes to a, a server and the server makes it that the posted preprint so the public can see that while the journal submission can continue the way it is. So in essence, we are not removing anything from the formal publication if we want, but at least we're opening up the process which used to be hidden from the public view to be available to the public view and allow us to have a very quick access to the results as they're going on. Prince, if you will study this diagram later on, they really promote uh, open science, support open access, allow revisions, allow corrections, uh, increase transparency, accommodate negative results, promote diversity and support the careers and funding as we go on. And at the same time, they enable a community review, which is not usually available otherwise. And this is really an important step towards having all knowledge to all people at all times. And what does the ISC say about that? Well, based on its values, principles and critique of the existing conditions, the ISC has articulated eight important positions. One, access, that there should be universal prompt and open access or record of science for authors, readers, no barriers, or particularly those on ability to pay institutional privilege, language or geography. That the possibility of reuse of the information should be available. There should be no licensing obstacles to that. And application of the modern methods of knowledge on past information is important. Then peer review must continue to be a fundamental part of the scientific process. But then access to data, we talked about FAIR and STREAM, here it is again. And then access of future generations to the record of science. That cumulative record of science with the tsunami of information that we're now dealing with has to be ensured that it's available and open access for future generations as well. And uh, you saw that, for example, in the example of uh, uh, Mendel uh, receiving recognition 35 years after his publication. Efficient publication, adaptation of the publishing system is important. We cannot allow our publishing systems to remain embedded in the past technologies, the past centuries, when the new technologies are doing so much for us. And seven, our publications should use the new technologies, it's the same uh, argument. And finally, governance. 
the governance of the processes of dissemination of scientific knowledge should be accountable to the scientific community. Right now, that is accountable to major commercial enterprises, technology companies whose uh, primary responsibility is to their investors rather than to the public good. And so my friends, I think I can't tell you exactly what's happening tomorrow or the day after, but I know that if we all work together to make all of this a reality, there is so much that we can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating and a really uh, comprehensive overview of what is a very complex topic and one that I think a number of myself and a number of our delegates are very keen to know more about, which is why we're here today. Um, so please do start entering your questions in the chat down at the bottom um, and I will be reading them out. We already have one. Someone was incredibly keen and, and jumped in quite early on in the discussion. Um, so someone would like to know, in what way has chat GPT and deep fake affected the quality of data? Do we have more fake news and more false data? Or do we need more rules to regulate the data generated? A very hot topic question for you no. now. You want me to answer that? I yes, answer that? Yeah, no, chat GPT is a very different thing. Uh, there are purposeful groups that are spreading, for example, information against vaccination, against uh, genetically modified organisms in plants, et cetera, et cetera, which are all false. Uh, but that's, they, they have even their own sites and their own uh, resources to do that. ChatGPT is basically a, a system that looks at everything that's on the internet and through a probabilistic set of algorithms uh, responds to you. As you know, if you write, for example, in an email or a, an, SD, an SMS, you start the word and then the computer will complete it for you. It will complete it for you based on probabilities from other things that you have written before and that uh, it recalls and it tries to find the one that is most likely. Well, it does this, uh, chat GPT does this on the whole internet and therefore it can put together sentences in ways that look almost human in every possible direction. But it is not the same as getting a, a uh, a, uh, a, a false purposely misinformation. They can probably give you good information as well. But fundamentally, personally, I prefer the search engine of uh, Google, let's say, over the search engine of a chat box because the chat box pulls different things and its own interpretation of what it found. Whereas Google allows me to see all the the, the relevant topics and I can choose the one I want to go to and this allows me therefore to go to the trusted sources that I can get the full information from. No, I agree. I, I know a number of people recently, I've seen um, a number of my friends, the librarians and scholars, and they've, they've been getting some astounding uh, fake things coming through. The authoritative tone of GPT is it really is quite convincing until you do the underlying research and realize it's made up completely fallacious publications. Um, so we've got a couple more questions here. Chat GPT is obviously a hot topic and everyone's very interested in it now. Um, so Dr. Ismail, some people have presented papers with Chat GPT as a co-author. Do you think this is an ethical um, method of publication? Well, to the extent that you can rely on getting uh an editor to help you improve your English uh, uh, or a research assistant to help you uh, with finding sources and uh, you may or may not give them appropriate credit on the paper, that is fine. On the other hand, uh, so ChatGPT can help you present material, uh, usually in a fairly simple fashion, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very capable of mimicking a, a human response. And that's what I think has taken it to a totally different level from what existed before and has even given people the feeling that it might be sentient, might have its own feelings and so yeah. on. But uh, uh, I think that we are still uh, in the beginnings of that new technology. And I think we will see a lot of transformation. I personally believe that we have any capacity even to imagine what the state of our work with uh, 
or even the steady state or work with artificial intelligence as humans will be uh, in the coming years. It's very Thank exciting. Um, and moving back onto the, the main topic right now, preprints, we have a, another question. The adoption of preprints would undermine the business models of major publishing corporations and the interests of their investors. How should an evolving preprint revolution address the publishers, ignore, fight, or collaborate? And that's a very pointed question uh, from Jeffrey Bolton. I'm sorry, uh, would you repeat that last part about... Uh, uh, the first bit is, the final bit is, so effectively the adoption of preprints is very challenging for the publishers. Um, but how should publishers' involvement be addressed? Should they be fought? Should they be ignored? Or should we see a scholar seek out collaboration with publishers? Uh, I think we can seek collaboration with publishers, but they will have to change their model. Uh, I have been one of the very nasty uh, person with many publishers uh, whose atrocious prices are beyond, I mean, the means of poor countries. Uh, I co-published something from the Library of Alexandria with Brill, and they did all the work in it, and they were being they were selling it for 120 euros. In Egypt, 120 euros, nobody will ever buy a book at 120 euros. And they mm -hmm. said, we don't. <laughs> that's that's our price. So they have to change their, their model. But I think the preprints liberate us from this, because the preprint show you what the author's first draft is, it shows you the debate with the peer reviewer and then what the final paper will be like, but you got to see the, the process from the beginning and that sometimes takes as much as a year. So uh, in, for example, during the pandemic, the, the keeping up with the new studies and research was extremely important for different people all around the world trying mm -hmm. to formulate public health policies uh, based on whatever was the best available data. And the sharing of that information immediately on preprints became extremely valuable. Thank you. Um, questions are coming in thick and fast now, so I'll just run, run through the list. Uh, another question. How will we control fake science being published through preprint? Who will organize the peer review of the preprint? Because currently there is a prestige associated with peer review at a re reputable journal. So researchers perhaps more likely to engage in peer review there rather than with preprint. Uh, pre How would you answer that? Well, the answer is that uh, that is true, but that is also the same way. I mean, all you are doing is you're opening up a process which normally would have been hidden. I mean, as an author, if I send something as I did, for example, to science or to nature, uh, it would go through the process, but then people would see it only when it's published. Now they can see my original draft, they can see the objections that are coming in, they can see how I have taken them on board, and they can then see the final uh, paper coming in. But the record of science has to involve a number of these things because uh, I gave examples in my historical review of many people who held what were considered outrageous views uh, at one point in time, and uh, which were then validated by, by experiment sometimes years later. I mean, let's take the example of Einstein. I mean, we've had, we all live in a Newtonian world. We think of space, three-dimensional space, time, uh, matter, energy, gravity drops something it falls well can you imagine a young this young guy coming in and says there's no such thing as space no no, no such thing as time it's called space time and there's no matter is equal to energy e equals mc squared and gravity doesn't really exist as a force it's a bending of the space-time continuum and really almost crazy ideas but they were validated the equally crazy ideas of of uh, quantum which he refused Einstein refused to, uh, to, to support were also supported. Uh, the same time when, when uh, uh, James Ellison said that uh, the immune system can help us fight cancer, which is now a major breakthrough for which he got the Nobel Prize with uh, Noriko in Japan. Uh, uh, it took him 25 years to convince people that we didn't have to go through chemo and radio and surgery and so on. We can actually open the in support the immune system and the immune system run around and, and and destroy all the cancer cells even if they are very small so this the ability to to have the record that's what i said the record of when these people said available and the scientific community is the one that recognizes that it did recognize this with nobel prizes 
whether it was the, the, the bacterial uh, uh, source of uh, uh, stomach ulcers or it is the immune system fighting cancer. All of that was recognized by the scientific community. And by the, 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 the fourth uh, science will fall by the wayside, pretty much like the cows growing out of people's <laughs> arms in the 1802 cartoon against vaccination. It will fall by the wayside. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So if you have any more questions, do chuck them in um, into the chat quickly. Um, one more com coming back to chat GPT again, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that it's very popular today. Um, yes, how would it provide the right citation without having access to paid scholarly resources? Um, does it uh, need to deal with publishers? Um, I'm not sure if this is wholly on point, but it, it is a question. So we'll just Pass it I, just in case. I, I think I understand what they're trying to say. Uh, since the chat GPT really looks at everything that's on, available on the internet, uh, it will find some um, uh, anti-science stuff as well as the science stuff. And where will it, uh, how will it pick up what to accept and what not to accept? Well, there are algorithms for that. It's basically based on a probability function. Uh, in other words, it looks at uh, a series of things and connects them with what is most likely to be the right thing. And to the extent that we can validate and on the, on the same equivalence of, of search engines, we validate uh, uh, particular websites, for example, for their, their value and their recognition. For example, if you do a search on something on Google, most probably Wikipedia will be if not number one or number two, maybe within the first five uh, items that will be identified. It's recognized as a trusted source and so on, so do other places. So the chat GPT will probably, and that's the key point, will probably give priority to better information. But it may every now and then do a crazy thing, bring you in a conclusion that's totally uh, uh, unexplained. Uh, for example, uh, there was a question posed to a chat GPT, is a pencil heavier or a toaster? And mm -hmm. it said the pencil is heavier. Very strange uh, for something that can write a full essay. How can it make a, complaint, uh, a mistake like that? So there are little things, little things that we still don't know, but it's a new technology. So I'm saying, you know, wait five, six years, see what's going to happen. It's going to become marvelous, even more marvelous than it already is. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, just before we, we wrap up on this session, there are some additional answers in the chat um, and some extra resources have been provided by some of the other presenters in response to these questions. So if you have any other questions, have a little browse in the chat as well. You might find something uh, useful and of interest there. And um, also just to wrap up the session, this particular bit, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ismail. This is an absolutely uh, brilliant introduction to this, this complex topic and a really great way to start the day. Um, so thank you. I think now we are ready to hand over to Jeffrey with our next talk. So I've already introduced uh, Jeffrey Bolton, so there's no need to do this again. Um, we've already told you everything about him. So I'll now hand over to him with his talk on the ISC and its work on open science and scientific publishing. Over to you, Jeffrey. Um, he seems to be potentially frozen. Jeffrey, can you hear us? You seem to be on mute and have frozen. Um, can you hear me now? Ah, yes, there you are. Hello, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. I will turn off my camera and mute myself and hand over to you. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. Can you put on the first slide? I see it's there. Good. So I'm going to add a little more detail to the terrain that Ismail has just so eloquently mapped out, and particularly stressing the roots of open science and the crucial connections between open science and publishing, and why so-called preprints could play a fundamental role in open science in future, whilst also satisfying the eight principles set out by the International Science Council and described by Ismail. Can I have the next slide, please? The means by which ideas, information and knowledge are transmitted 
are fundamental to the advancement of human societies. I illustrate here three critical staging points in the evolution of this process. Uh, on the left, an example from Europe of invention of cheap printing in the 15th century by Gutenberg, which made books and texts more widely available, leading to a great regional expansion of education and fundamentally influencing government, business, trade, and even, it's said by some, religious observance. In the middle, um, I suggest the next staging point, the first development of open science, represented by the publication in the late 17th century of the first scientific journals. The private world of science, based on personal letters, had become the public world of science, based on publication, accessible to those able to pay a subscription and receive a parcel with a journal. Crucially, the editors of these new journals also require the evidence on which truth claims were based to be concurrently submitted. These two, publication and evidence submission, enable distant authors to correspond and create a community of interaction that exposed truth claims to scrutiny and created a chain reaction that has stimulated the explosion of science over the last 300 years. The third knowledge revolution, of course, is the digital revolution in recent decades, which I'll expand upon later. Then the next slide, please. The open science revolution of the 17th century progressively led to two essential processes that made science a special form of knowledge and became the basis of its value to society. Firstly, the knowledge claims and the evidence on which they may be based are made openly available to be tested against reality, logic, through the scrutiny of peers. And secondly, that the results of scientific inquiry are communicated promptly into the public sphere and circulated efficiently to maximize their availability to all who may wish or need to access them. Go ahead, the next slide, please. Perennial scrutiny is a core value of science. It can invalidate, but it can't validate. It's the basis of so-called scientific self-correction. New truths, and I hope you can hear the inverted commas, are provisional. And here quotations from Einstein, from Kersler and, and Brecht powerfully stress this attribute. I particularly like the Kersler comment. <clears throat> can we have the next slide, please? One of the requirements of the 17th century journal editors was that their correspondents must submit the evidence, that is the data, that were used in their truth claims. It's been essential to the organized scrutiny of science and its power of self-correction, which is the source of its value, and eloquently evidenced here by two of the great scientists of the 19th and the 20th century. Next slide, please. The third knowledge revolution was unlike the previous two. They were slow and regional, whilst the digital revolution of recent decades has been fast and global. This explosion of digital data has proved to be the most powerful agent of the concept of the so-called knowledge economy introduced several decades ago by Peter Drucker, the Austrian-American innovator. It has fundamentally changed economies, but it's also enabled a new era of open science which is a potentially powerful means of exploiting its vast data fluxes. For example, it's provided the fuel that powers up the very same algorithms that only four decades ago, in the absence of such a massive data input, were able to produce only relatively trivial results. With that data input, they're able to solve patterns of great complexity, uh, such as the solution of biology's greatest challenge, which Ismail has already referred to that of identifying protein structure from its amino acid sequence. And of course, the creation of chat GP, which has been uh, loomed large in the chat here. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the fundamental tools that enable this new era of open science uh, and are, are immense and increasing computational power, vast data fluxes and artificial intelligence algorithms. The attributes of this new era have been progressively developed over the last 20 years, but every year ago, UNESCO produced this view of the operational requirements of this new phase of open science, which has been now been endorsed by UNESCO's 193 national members. The assumption is, in particular, 
that it will increase benefits to society and priorities such as the achievement of the SDGs through more transparent, collaborative and inclusive processes. Next slide, please. This slide encapsulates the ISC view of modern open science. It's important in the development of a new era of open science not to forget what science is. It's a special form of knowledge that depends upon continual open and skeptical scrutiny. Open science must be based on this scientific essence. It's otherwise worse than useless. That's why we in ISC place open data, open accessing pub access publishing, and openness to society in an inner orbit in this diagram. Without these, there is no science, and certainly no open science. The issues in the outer orbit are good to have, some might say essential, but of no worth if the issues on the inner orbit are missing. Note that open access publishing is not a nice to have, it's absolutely essential. Without it, open science would be no more than a dream. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The benefits of open science have hitherto been largely conjectural, with a relative paucity of concrete examples of its success. However, the spontaneous global scientific response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been a powerful example of open science in action. A wide variety of scientists have creatively shared, deployed and applied their knowledge, produced databases and websites, short-circuited the cumbersome processes of conventional publication, shared data and ideas with unprecedented openness and across the public-private interface. They've engaged citizens directly in effective and accessible ways that have helped condition responsible public attitudes, an experience it has, except where it's been highly politicized, embedded science more deeply in the public consciousness as a public good. The results have been remarkable, as shown here at the bottom of the slide, the comment by the director of the United States National Institute of Health. It's precisely this type of open science response that needs to be applied to the SDGs. Next slide, please. Rather than the general, non-specific way that UNESCO approaches open science, I personally prefer to offer more purposive, scientifically defined sets of objectives. These identify major opportunities for science and indicate much more clearly what the priorities for open science should be. They would help address the issues set out by e Ismail. Uh, a here is designed to maximize efficiency by minimizing expensive avoidable errors. Frankly, bad science wastes money. B is designed to enhance the connectivity of the international network of science to ensure, as far as possible, that no one is left behind. C recognizes that the major issues of modern science are technically complex and that open science offers new opportunities, the SDGs being a, a perfect example. D recognizes that public engagement with science is vital if many of the findings of science are to be effectively used and mis- and disinformation countered. The opportunity of E is largely a consequence of the digital revolution and demands serious global engagement between science and society. It recognizes that the emergence of a global science commons could play a vital role in many of the major issues that confront humanity. Rather than discussing those ideas in detail, however, I'll choose a couple of examples, those of integrity and openness to society. Next slide, please. In this case, the integrity of science is most effectively ensured when its basic processes are open and subject to critical scrutiny, as set out in this ISC report. This includes independent peer review, the deposition of relevant data in fair format at the time of publication, reproduction, which is the independent attempt to reproduce a published result using the original method and data, replication, which is the attempt to reproduce the original result using a different method, and different data, and retraction, which is the announcement that a published result has been falsified. In the public domain, and particularly in the political domain, retraction is regarded as an embarrassment. Politicians rarely do it. In science, it is success. It is the way that science advances, 
as the earlier comment from Charles Darwin noted. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In my second case, that of engagement with society, scientific solutions are often difficult to apply without active engagement, uh, as shown in this slide. The openness to society pillar of open science is crucial. It depends on the co-creation of relevant knowledge by scientists and stakeholders at whatever level that is needed. This, of course, poses a problem. Dominantly bibliometric evaluation systems tend to incentivize only one mode of doing science, the publication of papers, to the detriment of other equally important modes. Conventional publication is largely part of a conversation between scientists, not between scientists and the public. <clears throat> Large, <clears throat> excuse me. Largely because scientific publications are usually so complex as to be of, of no value or little value to non-scientists. Excuse me while I take some cold coffee. <clears throat> So it's vital that engagement with society is incentivized, something frankly that is unlikely to happen until we reform bibliometric evaluation. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I'd say that all of the preceding opportunities for open science depend on an efficient publication system, in which efficiency means serving the opportunities that I've just outlined and the principles set out by Ismail. Next slide, please. The reason that the system has become inefficient in delivering science as a public good is that we, the scientific community, have permitted a publishing monopoly to develop that is dysfunctional in delivering what science needs. The system depends on retaining the attributes of the former print and paper system rather than exploiting the digital processes that have produced major increases and in savings in almost all other industries. Science publishing is unique, in almost unique, in increasing prices even as costs have fallen because of what the system's inventor, Robert Maxwell, described as a perpetual financing machine. These processes were analysed in the ISC report that you see on the left, making scholarly publishing work for science in the digital era. Whilst the nature of the business models and the threat they pose to the future of science are analysed in the report to the right. Next slide, please. The final slide. The question is, how can we reform scientific publishing to the benefit of science? The image on the left is of an ISC report that identifies how the rapidly evolving open preprint movement could be the basis on which such necessary reforms could be created. Preprints mounted on institutional or, or independent not-for-profit servers to which continuing peer, a, a continuing peer review function could be added would offer speed, affordability, greater functionality and be more responsive to the needs of the international science community and to the development of open science uh, and will, I think, be discussed by Luke Drury in the next session. Preprints would also help us to escape from the restrictions of the current journal system, where giving articles a more independent life rather than be contained within journals. They would be identified through a record of versions rather than being fossilized in a static journal based version of record. The term preprint would no longer be appropriate. It would be something like an independent scientific article. This then is the way the International Science Council is attempting to stimulate change in the evolution of global publishing systems to maximize the potential of an open science future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was absolutely fascinating. I really liked in particular the idea of, um, well, more the, the sort of natural segue from the, the fact that publishers are selling reputational prestige rather than prioritizing academic rigor and then the solution that is very much to go to the sort of independent scientific articles so thank you that was that was really great um opening up the floor we've got time for a couple of questions so if anyone has any please do add them into the chat um 
while we wait, and hopefully people will feel a little less bashful and ask some questions, um, I, I have one for you, uh, Jeffrey. How did how long did it take the ISC to form that sort of tiered structure uh, of you know the nice to haves and the essentials? Um, and was it something you you organised like with a small coterie, or was it through a series of events like this a sort of community collaboration? Well, it's important not to think of this exercise being an ISC exercise. It's a scientific exercise. I mean, these sorts of ideas began to explode, really, in the first decade of the, of the present century. Um, I've been involved in one way or another for about 10 years since the Royal Society in London started to pick them up. Uh, the ISC then pulled these strands together, starting about four, three, four years ago, um, in recognizing that as a newly created organization from pre-existing ones, that what it must do is pick up some of the crucial issues for modern science, of which mm -hmm. open access and open publishing and open science are, are crucial ones. So I think one should overemphasize our role. Our role, in a sense, is being fo focusing what's already happening in the broader scientific community, rather than simply, be, simply being a, a separate monolith which creates its own version of the world. It's an, what we must do, we cannot do otherwise, and that is we must call on the excellence of the scientific community worldwide. The flow is from that broader society to ISC, and then a flow back, if you like, in a more coherent yeah. and, and distilled and refined. Um, in the absence of other questions, I'm going to be sneaky and ask one more because um, I'm very curious about this. Um, how obviously it, it's come up a couple of times in the Q&A previously, and, and it's, it's obviously one of the big issues around, um, around preprints, is particularly if one was to shift to that more independent academic article, sort of independent, standalone, unaffiliated with journals or publishers um, sort of concept, how does one ensure that every article does receive a fair peer review, that there is a steady stream of, of reviewers available? Obviously, reviewers are becoming increasingly scarce in a lot of subject fields. I know uh, delay is one of the problems with publishing more generally now with academic publishing. There are some very long delays for some subject fields and some specialities. So how does one ensure that what gets instantaneously onto the preprint server in order to maximize accessibility is not allowed to disseminate false false reviews from pe people who might read it and not care that it hasn't been openly reviewed yet. How does one prevent that sort of thing? Sorry, I appreciate that was a rather garbled question there. Well, it's given me an opportunity to focus on peer review, <clears throat> which is an enormous issue and what widely misunderstood. And currently, peer review is crumbling under pressure. And the reason it's doing it is that we have something like 5 million papers published a year, a large proportion of which uh, are supposed to be peer reviewed. Uh, do, you know, do you happen to know that the average number of letters that approaches to peer reviewers that need to be made, the average number by every journal is 70? Yeah. Now, the, the weight that puts on the scientific community of contributing to the profits of the publishing companies is enormous. It's been calculated that something something like three and a half million hours a year are spent on are, are spent on peer review, very badly organized peer review. One of the <laughs> interesting developments <clears throat> recently has been the development of independent of, of publication independent peer review. That is setting up systems of peer review based within the academic community, which are available for any publisher to use if they wish. In other words, they are reviews of the science um, and are there for anyone to use. Mm -hmm. So if you if your paper is refused by journal A, you go to journal B, which also turns you down, so you go to journal C, and with a bit of like all the three journals will use the same peer review. And because they have different approaches and different standards, the journal C might use what journal A refuses to use. The second issue, of course, is that peer review at the moment is very badly contrived the idea of a single moment in time when a scientific uh, publication is reviewed pre-publication peer review and that's it is frankly ridiculous 
uh, the real peer review, the peer review that really matters, the experiments, the careful replications that will take place in the years to come, the new discoveries that will show, as Einstein showed, that Newton really got it wrong. That took 300 years, as Ismail has said. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we need to do is have open peer review, where peer reviews are accessible to everyone, journals, other scientists. The reviewers are, are, are given credit for what they do, and it continues. It's a continuous process, not a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us, I mean, I, I, I look back on my experience and say, well, what proportion of the peer reviews I've had are of any value? And my answer was about 30%, I guess, are valuable peer reviews, whether accepting or rejecting, that uh, place important ideas in front of me, go through what I've written rather carefully. Uh, one third are useless. Um, <clears throat> and one third are dishonest um and the other thing of course we don't we don't know how much science we publish is rubbish is it 90 percent is rubbish or is it only 20 percent rubbish does hopefully review... i would say sorry just to interrupt you um, a i would say hopefully only 20 percent or even less but uh ismail is frantically waving his hand he wishes I'm... to jump in at this point and I'll, I'll just have to hand over just say but... we've got a very short amount of time we need to hop on because we're running a little behind but <clears throat> Um, I'll hand over to Ismail briefly to counter yeah, just, uh, or double answer. I, I, I really want to support a lot of what uh, Jeffrey is saying. And specifically, I want to cite that uh, in the pandemic, we had uh, all the scientists from all over the world were publishing preprints because they couldn't wait for the whole processes. But when you have an important conclusion coming up, like, for example, there was a particular a set of studies that were supposedly reporting things on uh, uh, data sets from a, a hospital system. And uh, then it was found that the way these uh, original data sets were, were problematic and uh, that set of studies stopped. This was during the pandemic. The reason I'm saying this is that, yes, there are a lot of things that have been published, put on, on, on preprints, uh, and some of them will be ignored for a number of years and some of them will be good. But the most important ones that are challenging the policies that are ongoing will be the first to be looked at by a lot of people, including technical peer reviewers and including just colleagues who are peers after all, who are reviewing the work of the others. And there is a self-cleaning that occurs very quickly. Uh, at least my perspective on this in the last two years has been that it's been done very quickly on archive and other uh, platforms of that kind, which not all is being reviewed, but the most important ones are being reviewed quickly. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey, if you've got nothing to add there, I'll, I'll move us on, um, unless you have a, a response, yeah, a response. I mean, I think the one thing is we have to remember, of course, is that in the, in the public mind, the phrase, a peer reviewed journal um, is significant. Uh, for those that do science, those of us that do science, it is less significant for very much the reasons that Ismail gave. I conduct my own peer review. I don't depend on someone else to peer review a paper for me. I do it myself. Most scientists do. Peer review is going on all the time. Yeah, it's more of a marker of externally imposed credibility, I suppose, than anything else. Um, on that note, I will just thank you again, Jeffrey, for a, clearly a very thought provoking talk. Um, again, if you have any other questions, do add them into the Q&A. We might have time to get to them later, but also we will be able to distribute them to our speakers after the event. And if you're very lucky, they might get back to you with an answer. Um, so, as I said, thank you, Jeffrey. And now we will move on to our panel discussion, a practical approach to normalizing preprints. And our first speaker, um, we can skip to the next slide, is Luke Drury with a talk on steps towards normalizing preprints. Luke Drury is Emeritus Professor of Astrophysics at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and Vice President of all European Academies, ALEA, the Federation of European Academies of Sciences and Humanities, where he chairs the Open Science Task Force. He is a member of the steering committee for the ISC Future of Scientific Publishing Project and the author of its occasional paper on normalizing preprints. Um, and again, as with everyone else, we're very honored to have him here speaking to all of us today. Um, so, Professor Luke, I will hand over to you and allow you to share your screen. 
So thank you very much. Um, let's go one. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to take part in this fascinating discussion. I want to talk a little bit about preprints and how they should be, in my view, they should be normalized. So let me just go. I think it's helpful to start by breaking down what we mean when we talk about publishing. I mean, what we tend to do is we tend to conflate what I think are three really quite distinct activities. The first and most important one, perhaps, is sharing data, methods, ideas, theories with our wider peer community, our fellow colleagues in science around the world. And in some sense, this is what the original meaning of publication, it's making public. The second, which has been emphasized in the preceding discussion, is the critical evaluation of these contributions by our colleagues, leading to assignment of um, significance. Is this a really important contribution? Is there something wrong with this? Is it a significant advance or just a basic impro slight improvement? So this is the peer review component. And finally, and this will resonate perhaps with Ismail as a librarian, there's a very important aspect, which is the long-term archiving, the cross-referencing, the cataloging. I mean, a warehouse full of books is not a library. A library is generated by the metadata, which allows you to find something in it. So cataloging, cross-referencing, indexing, long-term archiving for the future is something that actually needs more resources than it is currently getting, in my view. So these are the three components of publishing. And really, as has been said before, it is purely a legacy of the technology of paper-based printing with movable type that has caused these three different things to be lumped together in what we call the scientific journal. But now in the, we're now working in a digital age where we have much better means of doing these things. And frankly, the scientific journal does none of them very well. And we can and should, in my view, separate these and do them use appropriate tools for each of these three different things. So first of all, how do we share information with our colleagues? And the answer here has been for 50 years that we use preprints. Also in economics called working papers, I think other disciplines may have other names for these, but basically for 50 years or more, people have been frustrated by the slowness of getting papers into print in traditional journals. And they have been sending around early versions of their work as preprints or working papers uh, to get around this problem. And originally these were, I'm old enough to remember the days when these were generated from TypeScript manuscripts and either photocopied or mimeographed and distributed through the postal system. But nowadays, of course, we have far more efficient ways of doing it, starting with the archive. We now have a quite a broad range of dedicated computer servers where you can post a preprint and it will be available to everybody in the world at minimal cost. And this is actually an optimal solution in many ways to the rapid dissemination of new results. And we've seen this very dramatically with COVID, but also earlier with the Ebola outbreak, with monkeypox, the World Health Organization has explicitly called on scientists to use preprints to rapidly disseminate new results when addressing new and emerging crises of this nature. And it's interesting that actually this is now the, the by far the dominant mode of peer-to-peer -peer communication in my own area in astrophysics, also in theoretical physics, in mathematics, in economics. We don't go to the journals to find out the latest research. To keep abreast of what is happening in our field, we look at the preprints. And this is now spreading into the life sciences and other disciplines. The earth sciences are coming on board. And really, preprints are now widely accepted in many areas as being the primary source of information about new research. But of course, as has been said, community evaluation and peer review is critical. And as Jeffrey said, journal organized peer review is actually breaking under the strain of the, at the moment. 
it manifestly does not deliver the quality guarantee that it claims to. There are far too many cases of bad articles slipping through and the journals have a very poor record on retracting flawed work. I mean, perhaps the most egregious example is Andrew Wakefield's paper claiming a link between the MMR vaccine and autism, which has done untold harm and which, however, got through peer review and into a prestigious journal, The Lancet. And there are other examples. I mean, I think all of us know papers which have got through the system somehow and which should never really have been published. And as Jeffrey have said, basing your your idea of the value of a piece of work on simply two or three reports at one point in time from overworked colleagues chosen by an editor is far less useful than the nuanced evaluation of the peer community evolving over time. And there are alternative methods of doing this. We have interesting innovations like Peer Community In, Overlay Journals, F1000, and novel forms of peer review independent of journals, which I think offer interesting and improved alternatives. And I'd just like to draw attention to this article I come across just a few, few days ago, actually, it's just appeared on the 7th of February, uh, on the benefits of journal independent open peer review. And I draw attention to the highlighted sentence here, the increasing amount of non peer reviewed research published as preprints is enabling us to rethink how peer review is conducted. Now, I'm not going to, I don't have the definitive answer as to how we should do this, but there are opportunities here which we need to grab. Finally, of course, discovery, archiving, long term curation. Science is a global good of humanity, and it's not just for our colleagues today, it's for future generations. It has to be archived, it has to be preserved. And it's also no use publishing if it can't be found. I mean, the discovery aspect, particularly with the increasing volume of science and the increasing community of scientists around the world, is important. And nobody, I think, anymore reads the tables of contents in journals, at least I certainly don't. We all rely on recommendation and search engines, hopefully not ChatGPT, which is a disaster for this sort of thing. But I, in my view, there should be platform agnostic, but discipline specific search engines. I'm lucky, I work in astrophysics, and we have a very good system, the astrophysical data system, which basically gives you access to the entire literature of astronomy, astrophysics, and actually large parts of the physical sciences through a system which is funded by NASA, actually. So it's not a commercial service, and it treats all the journals and the and the preprint servers on an equal footing and it knows the specifics of the it knows some of the semantics of my discipline so for example if i search for snrs it knows that i'm looking for supernova remnants and it will find papers that cite supernova remnants or snrs or other synonyms so really if we had systems like that for other disciplines i think it would greatly improve the visibility of our preprints the other point I would make is that actually the metadata associated with an article is incredibly valuable because it's the basis for this sort of indexing, for searching, for discovery. And we need to be very careful that the commercial publishers do not monetize and grab this. And it is very important that as far as possible, we keep this in the public domain. So initiatives like OpenAlex, Crossrev, Orchid, etc. are should be supported. It's our job as scientists to try and keep this information available to everybody. And as I remarked, I think long term curation of digital content is seriously under resourced. Um, the new library of Alexandria is a nice example of how we should think of this as we should think. I mean, if I remember Ismail, he said it was born digital. And really, we need to have some global digital repository system similar to the great copyright depository libraries of the print era. So turning now briefly to just some of the advantages that I see for preprints. First of all, they do what they were designed to do. They enable the rapid dissemination of new research. And this is especially important in crises or fields which are rapidly developing. 
People sometimes say, if I post a preprint, my work may be stolen. Actually, I think it's the other way around. Time stamping by the repository is a very powerful method of resolving priority disputes, and it actually makes theft of results much more, much less likely. We've all heard horror stories of bad journal reviewers who've delayed publication so that they can get their own papers into, into print earlier. Uh, lightweight gatekeeping. Repositories don't operate full peer review, but they all have to operate some checks on who is allowed to post and what gets posted. You have to keep the cranks out. In the case of archive, you have to have previously published a paper on archive or be recommended by somebody who's done so to get onto it. And in rare cases, you can be banned for if you post absolute rubbish. So the, the, there has to be some form of lightweight gatekeeping. It's not full peer review, but it will make sure that the repositories on the whole carry useful material. A very important point, of course, is that the operating costs of digital repositories are very modest and can be easily covered by third parties so that neither the reader nor the author has to pay. Um, it's usually somewhere between 10 and 100 dollars or euros per article, very much less than the costs of publishing in a paper journal. Rights retention, a very important point. All repositories that I know of require something like a CC BY license. They never ask for a transfer of copyright. The original authors retain the right to reuse their material as they see fit. And as Jeffrey said, it's important that a digital record on a preprint archive can be updated in response to community feedback and peer review. You have a record of versions rather than a static immutable version of record, which is frozen in time. And a very important point is that most, uh, most preprint servers are community governed and owned, and this rests publishing out of the grip of rent seeking commercial corporations. Now, of course, there are disadvantages. The one which is most people raise immediately is that preprints are not peer reviewed. Well, I think the solution here is easy. There are new forms of online peer review evolving which do not rely on the broken and frankly dysfunctional system currently run by commercial journals. It is actually ironic that originally peer review was set up to select papers which were worthy of publication because printing was the most expensive and time consuming and labor intensive part of the process. Now, publication on the Internet is incredibly cheap and peer review is the time consuming and most expensive part of the system. And yet it's the one which is done pro bono by the community. It, it's crazy, really. Another disadvantage of preprints is that currently they are often not accepted in research evaluations. But here the solution is reform of research assessment, which is happening anyway for many reasons. And certainly, if you're talking about uh, awarding of research grants, it's ridiculous not to look at the most up-to-date evidence of activity by a researcher. So I, I think this is going to happen. Preprints are already in most systems accepted for grant applications. Uh, they will, I'm sure, become part of the routine research evaluation process in the near future. Uh, Preprints do need to be incorporated in discovery agents. Uh, the discovery agents run by the commercial publishers, Mirabile Dictu, tend to prioritize their own journals. Uh, so we do need, we need publicly owned discovery agents which can discover preprints. Uh, this is happening. I think as preprints become more widely used and become more normalized, search and discovery agents, even those operated by commercial publishers, will have to, become, have to adapt and cover them. And there is, of course, a valid concern that misleading or dangerous material might be spread in sensitive areas. And obviously, the obvious one is health, but equally um, political and social science. One can have very dangerous material, which could be seriously misleading or uh, have consequences, very undesirable social consequences. However, I have to say this is happening anyway. I mean, the journals do not have a, 
a very good record here. And in my view, the only solution is to put greater emphasis on the responsibility of scientists to respect principles of responsible science, research ethics. We need to educate journalists also that, you know, just because something has appeared in what claims to be a peer reviewed journal doesn't mean that it's absolute truth. The journalists need to be more critical and we need much better peer review. So my conclusions are that preprints and the associated community governed preprints repositories can be a very important step towards open science and the long overdue reform of scientific publishing. And just because science was communicated in a certain way 50 years ago, that's absolutely no reason why we should stick to these norms and conventions, especially when these have been monetized for their advantage by powerful commercial interests. So let's take full advantage of the internet. Let's go digital and make the communication of science more effective more participative, more diverse, and more inclusive. And this talk is CC by 4.0, as it should be, as it's an open science talk. So please feel free to reuse and share these slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Luke. That was absolutely you know, very, very interesting. Um, just to let you all know, we'll be having the Q&A at the end of this panel session. So without further ado, I will now move on to our next speaker in this panel, um, Professor Tosin Ek Ekundayo is a Dubai-based assistant professor with Synergy University Dubai, um, and he also doubles as an entrepreneur in Dubai in the United Kingdom. He's authored over 10 books and multiple articles and is uh, also a board member of international organizations, including the Center for Organization Leadership and Development, and a member of various other organizations across the world. And his particular area of expertise is data governance, entrepreneurship, and economic development. Um, so I will now hand over to him to talk about his paper on the role of data and technology in the normalizing of preprints and academicians' perspective. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Emily. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. All protocol observed. Um, I know we're far beyond schedule. I would not uh, waste too much of the time. Permit me to share my screen, please. Can the admin permit me to share my screen? I don't have access to that. I can't share my screen. Uh, Victoria, that was yeah. for you, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think, yes. Yeah. Let me see. No, I think you have to stop sharing your screen first. Uh, you can just click on uh, same remove my slides okay okay yeah. got it got it thank you all right <clears throat> can you see my screen you should yes okay brilliant good afternoon everyone my name is professor mm -hmm. Tosin. uh dr emily thank you very much for the brief introduction now i am happy to have this conversation because I have always been having this conversation, but to have this conversation at this level, it's amazing. Now, I'm not here to tell you what preprint is. As professional, I understand we all know what preprint is, but it's funny. In the midst of the preprint conversation, there's a whole lot going on about chat GPT. That's a whole lot of conversation for another time. But today I would focus on preprint. Now, we are in the MENA region. Every time we talk about preprint, I think one way or the other, we, try, we end up being unconsciously hypothetical about it. What I mean is we become, or if I talk about it, I talk about it in such a way that I end up or unconsciously become, become an hypocrite. Why? Because we all try to blame the system without looking at the behaviors of the people in the system. What I mean is this, when it comes to the issues of preprint, it's a framework that allows an individual who has conducted the scientific research to publish whatever they have done so that other people can actually contribute, which means it needs two groups of people, people on the reviewing end and the person who is exactly going to publish whatever they do. But permit me to make this personal. When was the last time I reviewed a paper for somebody who conducted the research? I'll push it to you as well. 
when was the last time you reviewed a paper for somebody who posted something somewhere to get your feedback as in form of preprint? Now, we blame the system. We blame technology. Technology is supposed to do this. Technology is supposed to do that. But what about us as individuals? This is where I want to focus on. Preprint would not work, even if you have the best of technology and the paper is there and we all practice this concept of preprint. If there's nobody on the other side to review and give me feedback, it still would not work. This is where I want us to focus on a bit, okay? There's been a lot of speakers who I actually appreciate. They all have this shared insight about the concept, how important it is, okay? I have a little bit of that, but I'm just going to skip it so it doesn't end up being repetitive. What is preprint? I'll run you through my slide, okay? I'll be a little bit fast, please bear with me. Preprint move science along faster, which is true. Before I even tell you about this particular definition, let me share you a little story with you. During my PhD, obviously you do a little bit of literature reviews, put some papers together. I discovered that some papers were not open science or were not, were not open, which means I had to pay $35, $22, whatever amount of money to get, okay? The reason was because I was developing an argument, which is something we all do. And I needed some evidences from one paper or one contribution to support my point or to support my perspective. Now, where I could get it, where I could afford it, that was fine, I got it. Where I could not afford it, guess what? I had to use a weaker paper to support my argument, thereby making my argument even weaker. Now, one thing that never ceases to amaze me is, I have never understood why somebody would conduct a research and discover insights that could possibly change the world and yet decide to lock it up. I'll give you an example. I know it might not be applicable to all the fields. The last speaker spoke about some areas of science, which is fine, but there are some areas that should be open. Now, when Dr. Emily was introducing me, she told me he's an entrepreneur who has a company. Now, I have a company in the UK. You know where the company came from? From my research, which means for every research that has been conducted, there is an insight that is usable somewhere in some place. Now, usability of this research might be you and might be someone else. Now, fortunately for me, for my research, the findings of my research gave birth to my company. At the beginning of my PhD study, I didn't even know I would find out something like that. It was during the research and after all the processes and I discovered, hey, this is something you have found. Okay, now, knowledge is to be utilized. When she was introducing me, she said, I do data science, its impact on entrepreneurship and economic development. For me, that's my field. So at every point in time, I see a data as a potential insight or as a potential input that would change or impact somebody's life. Might be me, might not be me, okay? So the idea of somebody having an insight that could be usable and locking it up, for me, I have never come to understand it, but I understand people have reasons for doing so, okay? Now, if you are one of those, who have a research insight and it's all locked up, of what value is it? I usually tell my students in class, knowledge has no meaning if it exists in your head. Your head is only a storage point. I like to teach my students in such a way that when I tell you something, the moment you step out of my class, you begin to utilize it. But I think some scholars or some researchers don't understand this kind of impact or this idea of uh, work that we actually do. Now, let me jump to my slides. Preprints are preliminary versions of scientific manuscripts that researchers share by posting to online platform. Okay, we're not new to this. So I'm just gonna skip it and just move on from there. Now, why might researchers consider preprints? We know this already. The last speaker and um, uh, uh, Ismail talked about this already to establish uh, <clears throat> priority in scientific discovery and breakthrough to increase visibility. We're not new to this. I will not bore you with this, okay? But my point being, there are problems in this field. For instance, look at some very rare statistics. Before I even go into the statistics, do we have scholars and researchers in the Middle East and North Africa? Of course. 
If I'm not mistaken, we have thousands of them. Yet, look at the report from the Digital Science for 2020, a global technology company. It says that the MENA region contributes less than 1%, less, not even one. So the question is, as scholars, as researchers, what have we been doing? We've only been focusing on writing papers and publishing in the Scopus Q1, Q2, is that all? How have we been supporting each other with opinions and feedback? Which means we don't even do this at all, okay? I won't bore you with much of the details, I'll move for the sake of time. Another research, as at February 2023, there's a server, X XIV, you know it. It's a preprint server specifically designed for researchers in the, in, the, in the Arab world, one that was launched in 2018. As of February 2023, which is this month, this server has received over 500 submissions in various fields. This is low. And yet, we talk about preprint. We have the technology. We just are not participating. We are not doing what you should do. Or you, I am not doing what I should do. Well, I have a valid excuse. I have classes. I am tired. I'm busy. Okay? As a result, we have low participation in the preprint concept. Another one, according to the Arab Council for Social Science, this is in 2021. Only 30% of the surveyed researchers in Arab world are even aware of preprint. And only 11% has used preprint as a means of sharing their research results. For instance, another angle you should look at it like this. For me, if I know about preprint, why should I use it? Why should I use it when I know nobody's going to contribute? So I think we put too much blame on technology. I think we need to change or reverse course and start looking at ourselves as scholars. How do we change our behavior towards this? If we don't change our behavior true towards this concept of preprint, we, are, we will continue blaming technology over and over and over again. And guess what? Technology is human. It's not going to defend itself. We will just keep moving in circles. But how do we fix this? How do we change? our attitude. There is a need for stakeholders to, con to conduct awareness. Who are those stakeholders? Could be universities, conferences. We're talking about this. A couple of months ago, nobody even, I don't think I've even attended the conference that ever, that has ever focused on preprint, but now we are doing so, okay? How can we push this message? This is a seven step, okay, uh, agenda for the region to change our attitude towards the concept of preprint. It's time for us to stop blaming technology. Is this server's fault? Is this? We have the servers. We are just not participating the way we should. Raise campaigns. Universities to tell their professors. Let me give you an instance. My universities will always ask me, how many papers have you published or how many papers have you written or conducted this year? But nobody would ever ask me, how many papers have you contributed to? Okay, so Tyson, just one yes. just let you know you've got one minute left on your 10 minutes. Thank okay, you. okay, okay, okay. So, number one, we need to raise awareness, okay, in our universities, in our circles, in our community, and stop blaming technology, okay. Number two, we need to engage stakeholders. We're doing that right now. We need to do more of this. I can tell you for sure there are researchers who have never heard of preprint, and that's pretty strange, okay. Now, number three, we need to build the infrastructure. There is infrastructure. We're just not paying attention to it. Okay, look at some servers. Look at servers that exist. Okay, that's on that. We need to encourage preprint submission. If you're going to encourage me to do that, then I must know that if I do it, I will get feedback. I can tell you a couple of platforms where I'll put a paper. In the next two to three months, there's no, we won't have a feedback. And yet I have scholars like me who see the same material. You see the logic now. So why then should we leave ourselves out of it and just keep blaming the technology? Technology is not going to review an article. A fellow human, a fellow researcher will, okay? We need to address cultural barriers. Don't say because you are not from the Arabic or Arab region, you are not going to uh, review a paper that is coming from the Arab region. We need to tackle that, okay? I have to move as fast as I can. We need to train researchers. People need to understand that research is just more, more than publication of papers in a Scopus journal. 
okay? The insight we find is to be distributed and shared among fellow researchers and sometimes even non-researchers who could turn it into something that is physical and change the world, okay? We need to foster collaboration. Preprint is a way we can actually do that. So this is the seven points agenda I think we should employ to change our attitude towards this preprint concept. Otherwise, we'll keep going round We'll keep going round in circles. We'll blame technology. We'll blame servers without changing our own attitude as people. If that's what we do, then we are hypocrites. We are all guilty of it. I am guilty of it. I'm aware. But you know you are guilty of it, and you have to change that. The technologies, the internet, chat GBT is not going to review your paper. A fellow human being will. This is my submission. I truly hope it makes sense. And I look forward to follow collaboration and contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tosin. And, and sorry for speeding you along there towards the end, but you have uh, triggered a very spirited uh, discussion in the chat. And I'm sure we'll have a, a good Q&A afterwards. Um, so now we'll move on to our final panelist um, for today. Uh, Itak Se Puebla, and I, I apologize if I've mispronounced your first name there. Um, she is the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Community for ASAP Bio. In her role, she works to foster awareness of preference and really drive community engagement, and also coordinates the organization's fellows program. Prior to this, she worked in publishing for 16 years, held editorial roles with various open access publishers, initially at Biomed Central and then at PLOS, where she was Deputy Editor-in-Chief uh, at the PLOS One Journal. And very excited to hear her talk now on resources available for the normalization of preprints. And I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you to FORM and the International Science Council for the opportunity to participate today. Um, I'm just going to put the, my slides and hopefully um, they will come up shortly. Um, so it's a bit tricky to follow on the previous two speakers, but I will do my best um, to tell you a little bit about what we do at ASAP Bio in promoting preprints. Uh, we believe there are many benefits as other speakers have already outlined in terms of uh, using preprints to share uh, rich research with the community and also with not only with scientists, but also with the society. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is the work that ASA Bio has done to develop resources with and for the community and also to nurture community champions who advocate for preprints. For those of you who may not be familiar with ASA Bio, we are a nonprofit with a mission to bring a speed innovation and transparency to communication in the life sciences. So we'll have a focus in, in life sciences research. Although we work very closely through different projects with uh, stakeholders in different disciplines. Um, the way that we drive our mission forward is that we have two main areas of focus. We support the productive use of preprints in the life sciences, and also we promote transparency in peer review. So to give you a bit of context as to what the landscape has been over the last 10 years of, or so for preprints in the life sciences, um, I just want to show you this um, interesting graph is data based on uh, indexing at EuroPMC, which is an indexing service that covers mostly biomedical sciences. Um, and as you can see, there's been quite robust increase in the use of preprints in the life sciences over the last 10 years or so. I want to nuance here. As others have mentioned, the fact that preprints have been used in the physical sciences for 30 years now through archive and again, even before through other experiments and also have preprints or working papers are quite common in the social sciences for, for quite a while as well. But things were looking different in the life sciences. It was relatively rare for uh, scientists working in these disciplines to sell their papers through preprint servers. Things started to change around 10 years ago with the uh, launch of BioArchive, a server dedicated to the life sciences. And then again, as I mentioned, there was year on year increase in the number of life sciences preprints that were be being uh, deposited in preprint servers. And as others have already mentioned, then there was a jump uh, for 2020 onwards in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic where many researchers decided to use preprint servers to sell their latest findings, the preliminary data that they thought could be useful to inform the response to the pandemic. 
In terms of uh, a sub bio, we were created in 2016 following a stakeholder convening looking at how preprints could be used in the life sciences. We very much believe in the power of community in driving uh, our activities, and we created the ASA Bio community in 2017. We have since run a number of uh, campaigns and outreach activities to raise awareness of preprints in the life sciences. And something else that we have done is also regularly host convenings of different stakeholders, within, which involve not only researchers, but also others such as publishers, funders, uh, representatives of preprint service or, or technology services to try to, again, drive adoption forward, discuss any challenges and develop best practices that can normalize the use of preprints. One thing that I would like to highlight, as uh, the last speaker has uh, rightly pointed out, is that while we have heard a lot about preprints over the last uh, few years, and I think that's fantastic, and in terms of increasing awareness, we recognize that there are still disparities as to how preprints are being used by different disciplines and also in different regions and what the level of awareness and adoption is in those uh, geographical regions. So as a, as a sense for the scale of the use of preprints in the life sciences specifically, again, based on data from EuroPMC, if we compare the number of preprints to the number of journal articles for biomedical sciences last year, the scale of preprints is around 10%. So, Robust increase over the last 10 years in terms of the use of preprints, but we know that there is still a scope for many more papers being preprinted and we think there is a lot of community work that can help drive that forward. So again, using preprints actually is, is involving driving this cultural change as to how science is communicated and, and how much control researchers can take about when they are ready to communicate that work with their community. And at this Bio, we believe that this culture change can be really driven by community champions. So researchers themselves who not only use preprints, but who drive those conversations with their collaborators, with their peers in their communities. And a big part of what we do as part of our programming is to really nurture those community champions, nurture preprint advocates who will have these conversations sometimes, you know, and uh, positive and sometimes perhaps a bit more tricky with the, with our peers as about the use of preprints, what benefits they can bring and what the challenges may be. So a big part of uh, our activities in the towards this goal is the fellows program. We started this in 2020 and we have since run this in yearly cohorts and actually we have the um, a call for applications for the 2023 cycle. I link the, the details there if you are interested in terms of applying to participate in our 2023 cohort. What does the fellows program involve? What we wanted to do with this program was to really equip our community members with the information, tools, and the skills that will allow them to not only understand the landscape and use preprints themselves, but also drive those discussions about the productive use of preprints with others in their community. So this is an eight-month program that covers different activities. We have monthly cohort calls with all of the participants where we give them information as to the latest developments around preprints what's happening related to initiatives for preprint feedback and preprint review, where do preprints fit within publishing and open science, et cetera. And we also discuss potential challenges and, and other areas to, to, to keep an eye on. Um, another important area of the fellows program is that we invite all of our fellows to work on a preprint project. This is something that fellows themselves may be interested in. They have an idea, an initiative they want to take forward. We provide them support uh, and hopefully involve others uh, participating in the program in helping them with that. Otherwise, what we do is we invite our fellows to join uh, initiatives that ASA Bio may be running for that particular year. And we involve them not, not only in the uh, providing dissemination efforts or participating, but also helping us strategically save those so that we best um, uh, address it to the to the target audiences. So I'm very pleased to say that over the last three years, the program has been very successful, um, and the pro the fellows have helped develop different projects 
They have worked on a number of outreach events with us, community calls. They hosted a couple of online webinars, and they have also developed a number of resources. And I'll be speaking about those a little bit in a second. Um, another area that we put quite a bit of an effort for on is uh, uh, developing resources with the community and for the community so that they can again that make get the information they need about uh, how to use preprints and how to use them in a productive way. Uh, a, a resource that we've had available for a while is our preprints FAQ. It is widely used. It provides a number of questions about different aspects of preprints and how to use them and any concerns about the scoping as well as responses and, and uh, information as to how to uh, address any of those. We have translations to French, Spanish, and Chinese for the FAQ as well. Uh, another resource that I wanted to highlight to this group is uh, the fact that a group of our fellows developed a guide for preprinting, specifically for early career researchers. They wanted to have a resource that was specifically addressed to that group because they realized that often early career researchers may be very interested in preprints, open science, and sharing more openly, but they have to have these tricky conversations with their uh, principal investigators, with their supervisors as to how to uh, get this started. So it is a guide that it was developed with early career researchers in mind. And it has some practical tips and resources, for example, a template guide for emails to, to reach out to your supervisor or collaborators to discuss whether you should preprint your next uh, paper. Uh, and another resource that uh, I very much wanted to highlight is the fact that we have a number of preprint infographics on the ASAP Bio website. This is also the result of different projects run uh, through our fellows program. So it was an idea raised by the fellows saying we want to have different resources in different formats. Why not develop some infographics? And we now have a set of infographics that they uh, uh, spearheaded and um, providing different elements of information all the way from what preprints are to where they fit in the publishing process or a five-step guide as to how to post uh, your preprint and have the best experience doing so. We also have translations for these infographics. And in fact, we are very open to community translations uh, for these files. If any of you is interested, please do reach out. We are in contact with some community members who are helping with translations to Arabic, but we very much welcome additional contributions to this. Uh, another resource that I wanted to also mention that may be relevant for those of you who may consider preprinting your next paper is our preprint server directory. This is a list of preprint servers. Um, we cover obviously biomedical sciences, but actually we also cover servers that are generalist and cover any discipline as well as other disciplines beyond biomedical. Um, and this is, again, it's a summary that provides information about the preprint servers out there, as well as quite a few details about each of those. So, for example, what disciplines they cover, what's the language coverage, where are the index, uh, aspects of uh, policies at the journal regarding a screening, so how do they decide uh, whether they, they want to do some gatekeeping for some potentially problematic papers, etc. There is plenty of information there. So again, I would encourage you to have a look if you're thinking about preprinting your next paper yeah, so that you choose the platform that fit, best fit, fits your needs and that of your collaborators. And then very briefly, apart from all of the resources, um, we also believe that it is important to do outreach and outreach to different groups uh, throughout the world. Um, I think it is true. I mean, Isa Bio comes from, from the US, and I think that talking to some of our communities in North America and Europe, many are already familiar with preprints, but that's not necessarily the case everywhere in the world. And I think we need to be very mindful about this. Um, as part of our fellows program, for example, at Isa Bio, we do put quite a bit of emphasis in having regional diversity among our participants. We want to hear the different perspectives and see what the different challenges may be. We have done certain uh, uh, activities in terms of regional outreach, uh, collaborating with local groups in, in regions in Asia and South America, for example. Over the last couple of years, we collaborated with groups in Latin America to run webinars about preprints in Spanish for the communities in that area. And we are very open, again, to collaborating with groups who may wish to do this um, in different regions. In addition, again, we want to empower our community members in driving initiatives themselves within our programs or beyond. 
So we have a framework to support community projects, both logistically and with promotion if we can, and also potentially with a little bit of financial support if it fits our requirements. And we have examples of projects that we have supported in this way. One is the Preprints in Motion podcast that was developed by one of the ASA Bio Fellows, Yoni Coates, who essentially interviews early career researchers who have uh, author preprints and they have a conversation about that work and, and the author's life in, in an academic setting, etc. We have also supported a few workshops run by our community members again in Africa and Asia we very much want to to uh, support that uh, um, that element of raising awareness for different communities so that's a little bit of what we do um I wanted to share the resources again there are a lot of our resources available on our website on the preprint resource center and just to wrap up I also wanted to invite those of you who are interested in preprints to join the ASA bio community you can join the community without entering in the fellows program, which uh, again is a bit more hands-on and requires some more time commitment, but being part of our community is a great way of getting the latest updates on preprints and connecting with others who are interested in preprints and open science. So I invite you to join, it's free, uh, and, and or you can contact me if you want more information as to what's involved. And with that, I look forward to any questions on the Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got time. I'm afraid we are running slightly over schedule, but as long as no one minds, we can definitely push back and, and carry on for a little bit later. So we have some questions already. Um, and while we're going through those, if you have any others, please do add them into the chat. Um, Luke, a question for you first. Some researchers fear that their work when shared using uh, CCBY licenses can be misused for commercial gain. How real is this fear and how can we overcome it? I, I don't, I've come across this. I don't think it's a valid concern. I mean, there is an issue with intellectual property rights, but that's independent, to be honest, of whether you publish as a preprint or in a journal. And I think there is a, an argument for reforming uh, patent laws to better reflect the principles of open science. I, I think it's more in the humanities, actually, where people are worried that if they publish CC BY, then uh, somebody else can take their work, translate it into another language and publish it. And that's a legitimate concern. And they are they can use CC BY NC, for example, which says non-commercial sharing. Uh, I can't honestly see why it should be a concern in the sciences. I mean, frankly, we all we're happy if more than 10 people read our papers <laughs> generally and if it's widely disseminated and reused why not i mean why should anyone worry about their work being widely disseminated we want to get it out there um brilliant thank you so much and as a humanities uh, person I also, I think we're all in, regardless of discipline, terribly excited when anyone reads your writing, regardless of, of what field you're in. Um, yeah. A question for Itache. Why has there been so much rise in the use of Research Square as a preprint repository? Is it something to do with Springer Nature being the major investor? Uh, the answer is yes, in the <laughs> sense that the way, <laughs> the way that, um, uh, this is set up through a Springer Nature, is that they have a partnership between a number of journals, not every Springer Nature journal, you know, they have a very large portfolio, but they do have a partnership between Research Square Preprint Server and a number of journals where if you submit to the journal as an author, during the submission process, they will invite you to submit the paper to the preprint server as well in parallel. So essentially, it's, it's not going preprint journal, it's rather than you submit to the journal and the journal offers this service for free, which means that certainly there is a, I believe the majority of the content in that server comes through the journal workflow rather than individual researchers submitting directly. That's really interesting. Thank you. I'm sure the, the delegate asking the question will be fascinated by that as well. And uh, Professor Tassin, a question for you as well. Um, interesting statistics in MENA for preprints. Is 30% very low to compare to other countries or regions? So that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, what could be the reasons as to why there is a lack of awareness for preprints in MENA? Um, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I'll take the, the second question first. We don't talk about it often enough. 
we don't. We should have the conversation in our communities, in schools, in our offices, for everyone. It's, you know, I've been in academic communities where all we talk about is about a research, publish a paper, quarter one, quarter two, scopus indexing. But you, according to, I remember uh, Ishmael said something at the beginning. He said preprint should be part of the research or scientific process. So we've totally excluded it completely and we don't even talk about it, let alone participate in it. This is where I think we should change our behaviors. These academic communities will keep referring to, it's about you and I, it's not a vague concept that is just there that's supposed to take care of itself. We are the ones participating in that industry. So we need to participate, that's number one. Number two, for the first question you ask, it's 30% low. Now, that would depend on the areas where this 30% review is coming from. If we dig deep, I won't be surprised if we find this 30% related to sciences, pure sciences. So what happened to humanities? What happened to other areas of academia that we have to conduct research? So 30% is pretty low, to be honest. I know the sciences, they do that a lot, but you see these uh, social sciences, everybody just wants to go solo. Everybody just wants to be a champion. And that's not the essence of what we do. What we do, one of the essence of what we do is for us to collaborate, for us to collaborate and get something done. This is why I'm sharing my paper. So at least I can get your input, but nobody wants to give me that input. After waiting for two months, guess what? I go solo. Why? Because I want to publish, get caught I one so I can get the next promotion. I think we're sidelining a crucial aspect of the work that we're actually supposed to do. And that's my position. I hope I, I was able to answer that clearly enough. Okay. okay. Thank you. You did. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, well, we have no more questions at this point. Once again, we're going to move on to the next section now, the interactive section. But if you do have any other questions that come to you during the breakout session or even after the event, do get in touch, do add them to the chat here or do send us an email and we will distribute them to the speakers. Now we have an interactive little activity for you to get you back on your toes and get you ready for the breakout rooms. So I will hand over. Um, and you will be run through this section. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen. What you're going to need for this particular session is, um, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Great. So what you're going to need for this particular section is your mobile phones, or you could do this also on your computers if you're um, if you're connected to a laptop or a computer and don't want to change screens. But what I would ask you asking you to do now is to go on to uh, uh, to to your browser and type www.menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I. We're going to go through a small poll to get a sense of who's in the room and what are the broad opinions before we go into the breakout sessions, and then we'll have a chance to discuss these further. So if you could go on to menti.com, and it'll, it's going to ask you for a code, and the code is 88737162. It's on the screen over here, 88737162. I was not in presentation mode. <laughs> you could also just use the QR code. So let me just get a sense of how many of you are in here. Great, we have one person in. So I'll give you some time to get in. So just type in menti.com and then this code. All right, I'll just wait for another second. Is there is there anyone who's struggling with this? You need some help. All right, now people are really starting to come in. Is 
So let's move on to the first question. The instructions will stay on the top of the slide. So those of you who are still joining will still see the code and the, the link that you need to be able to join. And if you have any trouble, just drop it in the chat and one of my colleagues will, will help you through. So the first question is, which of the stakeholder groups do you belong to? Um, and you have a few options there, um, which includes NGO policy advocates, government or other policy makers, university representatives, librarians, early career researchers, which for our case we've defined as research assistants, associates, PhDs, and postdocs. If you don't fall into one of those categories, you're, you can choose academicians. Um, and of course, if you're typing other, uh, do drop into the chat box what, what your stakeholder group is and what we've missed here. I'm going to give you another few seconds. There's still quite a few people that are not in the poll, so I'm wondering if there's a technical issue or just that I haven't explained very well how you can join. For those of you who are still trying to join, the, the code and the link are still on the top of the slides. Academician, we have one in the comments. That's that's a category in the in the choices. So you could add your choice there. All right, it seems like we've stopped getting responses. Uh, a lot of you are academicians. We have quite a few early career researchers, which is really good news because that's really a, one of the categories that we're trying to reach. Um, a few NGO policy advocates, so we are part of that group, librarians, university representatives, um, and three people who have chosen others. So if you could drop in the comment section what category uh, you belong to, that would be very helpful. Thanks for sharing the link again, Janice. All right, moving on to the next question. In the MENA region, what do you think would be the most influential stakeholders for promoting the normalization of preprints? So here's, it's an open-ended question. I see some of you have already moved on to, the, to this question before you finish with the previous one. You can type in your answers and you see them as a word cloud. So the more people that choose a specific answer, the bigger that particular word gets. So you could choose one of the words that's already on the screen, or you could enter a new word uh, if you think that your option is not already here. You see that ISC is the biggest response so far. That's a lot of responsibility. So I'm hoping that other options will pop up. We have some who've opted for universities, funders. Publishers academic repositories. So it looks like it's funders, universities, publishers. And then followed by researchers, universities that are the most influential stakeholders in the opinion of the room. Moving on to the next question, you can continue to answer this um, once I've moved on. 
What are the biggest barriers to normalizing preprints in your opinion? So here you have to rank the options being evaluation systems that prioritize commercial publishers, lack of commitment to the cause of open access, lack of awareness of the alternatives um, or others. And again, in the case, if you choose others as one of your top choices, uh, we'd really appreciate if you could drop in the comments what those are. These rankings will change as more of you enter your, your answers. But it seems like the evaluation systems remain the top choice for a lot of you, followed by awareness of alternatives and commitment to the cause of open access. Some of you have already chosen the option of other barriers, so please drop into the comments what you think those are. And we have here from, let's say, reluctance concerns by supervisors or collaborators. government is another barrier. So that would be creating an enabling policy environment in one way. Great, moving to the next question now. What prevents early career researchers from posting preprints of their work? Is it the lack of familiarity with the benefits of preprints? Is it the lack of institutional support for preprint practices? Is it that they have no access to educational resources on preprints for raising awareness? Is it general skepticism about the value of preprints or is it for other reasons? It's interesting to see that the general skepticism for the value of preprints is on the top at the moment. It, that speaks to some of the presentations we've heard earlier on today. We need to work on the awareness building. Other options include that early career researchers may want to go with preprints, but their supervisor doesn't agree or cannot decide. They cannot decide. So it looks like our top choice is lack of institutional support for preprint practices, followed by a general skepticism about the value of preprints. Uh, and then lack of familiarity with the benefits. And those two might be actually quite closely linked. So that's the end of our polling session. The poll can remain open and you can, you're free to, to go ahead and continue entering your votes uh, and we'll have access to this after the event. So we will be using this information in our output document. Um, I now ask you to join a, a breakout group uh, we've divided the breakout groups based on the category that you chose here, or if you didn't choose a category, then based on the categories that. Um, so we addressed uh, the questions as we were given, and our conclusion uh, was 
that um, um, preprints were a good idea. <laughs> and the reason why they're a good idea, as opposed to the current system, is a current system limits the circulation of ideas. And it does that if you happen to be sitting in a, in a poor institution, in a poor country, you cannot afford to get your brilliant idea into nature, which will ensure that you have good circulation. You are forced to put it into a journal, which possibly few people read. Therefore, the argument for a, a record of versions rather than a version of record is a powerful argument. It means that I want to be able to press a button and know which six articles in no matter which journal have been written in my field so that I can use them. And at the moment, the process of finding out what is happening is very, very inefficient. So that's why the present system is a poor one. Um, and it's also the benefit that could come from, um, from preprints. Um, we said that bibliometric indices which favor the well-known commercial journals are a real barrier to uptake, a major barrier. And we regionally have different problems, but they're essentially rather sim there are essentially similar problems which have regional variants. They need to be addressed. I think our, our last comment would be there are many aspects of preprint use which are relatively immature. It's taken 60 years for commercial publishing to get to its present state. It shouldn't take so long to get, pub get preprints right. But there are a number of issues which have been touched on during this meeting and the discussion which need to be addressed, period. Thank you, Geoffrey, and thank you to everyone um, in breakout room one for, for all your ideas and breakout room two. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Uh, yeah, and I was moderating the breakout room two discussions, which uh, comprised of early career researchers. And one of the things that was, you know, very clearly evident was the, uh, you know, uh, need for awareness on preprints. So uh, the, the point that came up was, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about preprints, but what about our fears as early career researchers that somebody could plagiarize my work, somebody could copy the work that I'm doing, so where is the security? Uh, early career researchers largely feel that the journal system is more secure. Uh, we were lucky to have Luke as part of the discussion, and what we understood from the discussion was that, in fact, other than the papers that are there, it's the preprints which gives early career researchers security, because as soon as you've published your research as a preprint, it is time-stamped. And everybody knows that on this date, you have published your work. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the participants mentioned that this is the reason why we need to have such programs so that many of the fears sometimes about preprints are, you know, unfounded. And uh, we could be in a system that believes that or, or is made to believe that journal publication is the best way, whereas preprints could be a, a, a more ideal way forward. A, a lot of interesting things that came out of the discussion about particularly with regard to the MENA region on why gender is a, is a big issue, you know, cultural differences that are there uh, that, that could come, uh, you know, some, some kind of topics that could be taboo to research as well. So uh, very interesting topics that came up. Uh, I, I, if I had to just say it in one sentence, uh, the discussion only reinforced why we need to have more programs like this mm -hmm. to popularize. In fact, the participants said we need to impose preprints, not just popularize it. <laughs> so yeah, that that was the outcome of the discussion. Yeah, thank you for the Next steps further along. Thank you, thank you very much, and once again, thank you to all the uh, early career researchers in that room contributing their views. Unfortunately, Group Three, we had no volunteers for that group, um, so we don't have any. Uh, input from NGOs and policymakers and funders. However, on to group four, uh, please share your ideas. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, so again, another interesting discussion in a way uh, that we 
uh, in that was in that group. So we we had a lot of ideas also to how to take preprint forward advantages of it. Uh, however, I have to echo with Janice because it's the, exactly one of the things that um, <laughs> the acceptance of it. Because in the region, it looks like <laughs> that. Yet the uh, researchers are not very much aware of the what exactly preprint is, how it is beneficial, and also the fear that it might be detrimental to their career is something that we have to address. So again, such kind of the event really is important and maybe even more widespread to first tell them what exactly preprint is or how it can help is something that was uh, that is one of the major uh, uh, finding from the discussion. Uh, and everybody agrees that there are problems with the current publication system. So preprint probably is a way, but we need more um, more knowledge about it uh, and also how it can be uh, how researchers would really get adequate start using preprint is where that maybe a top-down approach for example universities can um, tell researchers to maybe make a policy of it funders can make so a top-down approach is useful but then on the other hand there were discussion that uh, it should be bottom up as well. For example, in a paper, all the co-authors should agree to the idea of preprint and they should agree on where uh, they could deposit their preprint. So, so this is one of the thing. And also another very important thing that came up is that the quality of preprint should be ensured from the beginning in, so that when a paper is kind of fully ready, uh, the researchers are happy with the outcome, then only they should put it on the um, as in preprint, so that the credibility of the preprint, we don't lose the credibility. It's not that everything is dumped onto it. So that kind of credibility is important. And so that's why there is a need on to reinforce that not everything goes into the, as a preprint, there can be some kind of checks and balances there. So this is uh, what are the main points that we found out from the group four. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so I think overall that was really interesting. And now I will hand over because we now have a sort of a summary of, of next steps, I believe. Oh yeah, and just a reminder about the Google documents will be open uh, for another two days. <laughs> Do apologize. Um, and there will be an outcome document created by the uh, International Science Council, which will be shared to everyone. And also, we'll be sending an email out after this event with a link for you all to join the Open Science Newsletter. I have just registered. I'm very excited. I hope you'll all uh, register as well. And the January uh, newsletter has actually just, just come out quite recently and makes for a very interesting read. Um, and now I will hand over... Uh, to Luke to, to provide us with some concluding remarks on the day's event. So thank you, Emily. Um, it's difficult to summarize such a wide ranging discussion, but I think there are some themes that are worth reiterating. Uh, firstly, I think we haven't realize, realized the potential of modern information technology. If you think about it, it is quite extraordinary how cheap it now is to store large amounts of data and to share data efficiently across continents. This is something we could never do before. We have to ask, why has the Internet not disrupted the model of scholarly communication the way it has so many other areas? I mean, Ismail raised this point, Jeffrey raised it. Why have we not taken full advantage of the possibilities that are now open to us. Uh, secondly, I, I think it's worth making the point that in some ways open science is a bit of, mis of a misnomer. I mean, science has always been open. As Ismail pointed out, the whole ethos of science is that you openly share the evidence for the th claims you're making, you openly share your ideas, and you expect people to criticize them. So in some sense, science is by definition open, the whole point is we can now make it more open than it was in the past. We do need to be aware of cultural sensitivities, of linguistic sensitivities, of multilingualism. I think this is something that science has been quite bad at. We have, I hesitate to use the word imposed, 
but there is a sort of hegemonic model of the this is the way science was done in Europe and North America back in the 1960s and that's the way everyone has to do it forever and that is simply wrong we need to open up science particularly if we want to have more impact on society to bring in citizen science scientists then we have to have a more open science which is also going to be a more linguistically diverse science uh, I don't think we've taken advantage of the possibilities of machine translation. One can imagine preprint servers which offer translations into different languages. It could be done. Why isn't it being done? That would be much more interesting in my view than chat GPT. <laughs> we need to be aware of the responsibility of scientists. I mean, the more open we make science, the greater the potential, both for good and for bad, is. And if we have a really open science, then there is a great responsibility on us as scientists to think about the consequences of what we're publishing. Uh, we can't rely on the journalists and referees to pick up on this. We, it is our responsibility to think about the consequences of what we're putting out into the public domain. So those are my takeaways from today. I think it's very interesting. I mean, one thing that is certainly clear is that there is a need to have this discussion, to raise awareness of the potential of preprints. They're not the only route to open science, but in my view, they are one of the most effective routes and something that we should be doing anyway. Uh, so I hope that has contributed to some clarification and stimulated some thoughts. And if we can see some action, that would be great. So I think at that point, I'll stop and hand back to you, Emily. Thank you, Luke. That was a, a really helpful summary, I think, of, of what we've covered today, which has been quite wide ranging. And, and hopefully we will, as you say, have outcomes and actions would be um, brilliant. Victoria, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so just a little to wrap up, this is, as we mentioned at the start of the event, this is actually the first of our uh, community development activities. We will be having events every month, um, though we're taking a short break during Ramadan. So there will be a lot of activities coming up, each one in partnership with a different organisation. Uh, next in March, we've got, um, actually, I will be representing Knowledge and talking about predatory practices, uh, conferences and journals. Then we will have Coalition S talking about rights retention, which as we've learned today is obviously very important. Um, and then later in May, we will be having the Directory of Open Access Journals. We'll be talking about what they've done so far, their sort of overall strategy for Northern Africa. Um, and we'll be adding more over the next few months. So please do take note of the uh, URL or use the uh, QR code to register for these events. Um, next slide, please. And more importantly to my mind, um, I'm very happy to announce that the call for papers is now open for this year's annual forum. So the goal of the annual forum is to bring together leading international experts and key regional stakeholders to uh, exchange ideas and strategies relating to the Arab world's transition to open science, specifically within um, research communities and the higher education sector. Every year we hold the forum in a different uh, state. Last year it was in Cairo and we were very lucky. We had the support and endorsement of UNESCO and the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. And we had over 1,100 delegates from 48 countries come, which was really great for our first event. This year, we are holding the event in Abu Dhabi, but it will probably also be online as well. We're exploring uh, the feasibility of a fully hybrid model. And the theme of this event is democratizing knowledge, the evolution of open science ecosystems and research communities in the Arab world. Khalifa University, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, is our host partner. And I do hope uh, some of you will look at the call for papers and maybe consider giving a talk on preprints. Clearly, it's a very hot topic and we need to have as much discussion about it here as possible. Um, the call for papers is actually officially launching tomorrow. So you're all very lucky in getting a little sneak preview now. Um, and other than that, it just leaves me to say thank you again so much 
to all of our speakers and our moderators and all of you as the attendees for sharing your ideas, for posing questions and really contributing to the ongoing discussion around preprints, both globally and, and specifically uh, within this region. Um, and a particular thanks to the International Science Council for kindly agreeing not only to work with us on this event and, and proposing the topic um, for our, our first community development activity, but also putting on such a, a, a really great, tremendous, uh, this isn't just a mere webinar, this was a whole symposium, and I think we've all really appreciated the depth and breadth of, of the topic and how much we've been able to cover and explore today. So there is a survey um, that will help us improve your experience. So if there's things you liked about today, things that you felt maybe didn't work, and also, topics either within preprints or more generally across open science that you would very much like us to cover next time. Um, please do take the time. I know you all have done an awful lot today already, but if you do have a few minutes to just give us your thoughts, that, that would be hugely helpful so we can hopefully put on more great events like today. Um, so without further ado, just use me, I'm the only person here now. So I'll just clap all the speakers on everyone's behalf and just say thank you again so much. Um, and I hope you have all had as enjoyable a time as we have had. <laughs>